the honor and pleasure of introducing Mr. Lemar Goldwater, a graduate of, I think that, what's that school? The, the wire? Some other school we know. <laughs> um, I guess I should also mention that he's a state championship athlete from Hawaii. He led the team the ultimate title. A graduate also of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte with a degree in psychology. 10-year professional basketball player, and just we invited him in to share some you know, tips on life experiences and college preparation, things that would benefit you. So please welcome Mr. Lee Michael Wire. Hello, how are you guys doing? Good. I'm excited to, to be here. Um, I hear a lot of great things about you guys, and I just wanted to shared some wisdom and some of my experience from over the course of my life. Um, I'm from right here, born and raised in the city of Riviera Beach. I grew up right here on 26th Street and S. Avenue. I remember walking to John F. Kennedy Middle School every day. And every morning, my grandmother would give me a dollar. And I spent 75 cents of it before I even touched the campus. There's a little corner store right here. And I used to buy oatmeal pie, quarter juice, and buy a pack of uh, winter fresh gum. That was my morning routine. See, I believe a life, life is a collection of experiences. Our experiences is what makes us unique. Our experiences is what makes us, well, it's what makes us us. Two people can experience the same thing, but yet they'll be two totally different outcomes, two different perspectives, two different outcomes, two different results. Yet my experiences have brought me before you. What I learned to do with my pain, my hurt, and my trauma, I took the hardships of my life and I allowed it to make me better and not bitter. Through all of my difficulties, I found my passion. I found my career. I played 10 years of professional basketball in Europe, South America, and the Middle East. I played in Italy, Turkey, Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Israel, Latvia, Russia. I played in places where they don't even speak English. But because I had a passion and a talent, I connected with people from all over the world. And I learned to speak three different languages. I'm a little bit rusty, but I learned to speak Italian. I learned to speak Spanish, and I learned to speak Turkish. This helped me assimilate to the culture. Now my passion and talent allowed me to meet people who I would never meet had I allowed the circumstances of my past to hold me back. Growing up, I was, I was way too young to experience the things that I experienced, but it was the life that I was given, the cards that was dealt, the hand that I had to play. See, I grew up without my parents. I grew up without the people who made it possible for me to be here. My mom was in a serious car accident when I was nine years old. She was with her friends. It was five people in the car. She was in the, the back, in the middle seat, and the car was hit by a drunk driver. She flew from the back through the front windshield and had a serious uh, traumatic head injury. She was the only one severely injured in the accident. In that moment, she was never able to speak again, to walk again or feed herself again. She would be confined to a, birth, a bed in the nurse, in a nursing home for the next 20 years of her life. She could only raise one arm and she could only laugh or speak, or laugh or smile when there was comedy on the TV in the, the nursing home because that was the only part of her brain, her, the, her brain was still functional a little bit so her brain would recognize that and her brain would respond with laughter. See, I remember coming home from school one day. I had just got good grades on my report card and I wanted to share it with my mom. I was seven years old. I come into the house, I'm excited. I want to share my enthusiasm with her. So I go into her room, I open the door, and she's not in there. But there's this aroma just flowing throughout the house. And it's a smell that I smelled before, so I know that she's home. So 
So I go into my room, which I share with my brothers and sisters, and she's not in there. So I check the third door. My uncle was living with us. I go into the room, I open the door, I see my mom and I see my uncle. But my mom doesn't recognize me because she's concentrating on what she's about to do. So she had a, she had a spoon, it was a white substance on the spoon, and she had a lighter heating it up. She was getting ready to take her next hit. And that was the day I learned that my mom was addicted to drugs. And in that moment, my uncle saw me and said, man, don't you ever do drugs. But the people that I love and care for are doing drugs right in front of me. See, my life is a sum total of my experiences. The man I am now, I can reflect back and ask, what was she going through to turn to drugs and alcohol to cope with life? But my father was the same. I didn't see him much growing up. He was in and out of rehabs his whole life. He saw me battle with drugs and alcohol his whole life up until the day he died, in which he died of a drug overdose. My father died in June 2016. And although we wasn't close, although we didn't have the kind of relationship that I would like to have had with him, it still hurt me to my soul, hurt me to my core when he passed away. And then my mother passed away a month later, in July 2016, from the injuries that she suffered 20 years prior. So while my life was difficult, I found my passion. I learned how to manage my stress levels. I learned how to properly deal with my insecurities, my self-doubt. See, most people where I'm from, they don't have their they don't have their father. But I didn't have my mother or my father. So I remember questioning life like, does God even love me? I had to learn to handle my feelings of feeling like I don't matter. Now I can walk in a place with my head held high and feel and be proud of myself, despite not hearing I love you, I'm proud of you, I believe in you. I learned that everything doesn't deserve a reaction. Everything doesn't deserve your attention because my time and energy matters. So ask yourself, are you doing what you want to do because you're passionate about it? Or are you doing what you're doing because someone's pulling the strings to your life and making you do what you do? Do you wake up every day ready to attack the day? Do you wake up ready to take advantage of the opportunity that you've been given? Do you, are you preparing yourself for the challenges that lay ahead of you? When things get stressful, how do you handle it? How do you balance your life? Are you enjoying your life? Do you want to live a life that says I'm doing what my parents want me to do? Or do you want to live a life that says I'm living in my God-given abilities? See, I learned to attract what I want by becoming the kind of person that success wants to attach itself to. See, the popular thing today is I'm chasing money. I'm chasing success. I'm chasing material things. But will it fulfill you? Will it make you happy? The thing that ultimately made me happy is that I live out my passion. I lived in my gift. I played ball for 10 years in a foreign place. And not one day did I go to work because I love what I do. So I ask you, what are you passionate about? What will you do that impacts the next generation? What will you do that speaks to your soul? What set of footprints will you leave? Thank you. I think Coach wanted to do a, a q and A if anyone had questions and that I could possibly answer or give some insight or wisdom about anything you guys may be going through. How was it um, like going to college your first year? Going to college my first year was, honestly, it was difficult because once my mom's situation happened, I moved with my grandma. And she actually died two months before I went to college. So when I went to college, I was very much grieving, but I didn't know that I was grieving because I was a young kid and I didn't have anybody to really talk to that about. So my first year was, was difficult. Um, looking back, I can see that I know why it was difficult because I was grieving. 
Um, but it was a good, it was a great experience. It was my first time really away from home, first time living on my own. Um, I met some uh, amazing people. I was on I was on a full scholarship, so played in a lot of big games. Um, but I, I enjoyed college. I enjoyed my first year too. It was a little bit different, but I enjoyed. It. If I could give my younger self advice, what would I say? You don't have to be so strong. If you got people that care for you, be sure to let them know like what's going on in your mind. Because I, I was dealing with a whole lot from my mom and my dad's situation. And the mentor that was in my life, I wouldn't let them into how I was truly feeling. I would put on a facade if I'm, I'm good, I'm always good. But the reality was I wasn't. So for me, it would be me opening up and allowing my mentors to truly help me. Um, if there was like one moment in your life that you could change, um, what would it be? If there was one moment in my life that I would change, what would it be? This is a tough question because everything that I am now is because of what I went through, right? But I would love to have had my mom. I would love, because her situation made it so that she couldn't come to my games. No matter my highs, she couldn't be there. If I wanted to call and say, Mom, can you just pray for us? She couldn't do it. Can you just cook my favorite meal? She couldn't do it. So that would be what I would change, but it's like, Anybody else? Uh, are you related to Anthony Goldhart? Yes, I am related to Anthony Goldhart. I think he won the first state high school basketball ship here in 1992, I think. Yes. And I'm, I mean, we're very close to him. But I didn't meet him until I was 14 because my dad was in and out of my life, so I didn't know that side of the family. And actually, let me tell you a quick story. So when Anthony came, I was 14 when he came uh, to do a basketball camp, and I just showed up like, dude, I'm your cousin. <laughs> and after that, he was like, you know what? It was a basketball camp here for a week. I was there for a week, and he was like, you want to come to Houston? Because that's what he did in Houston, Texas. And I was like, yeah. And that was the first person who showed me how to have, how to be a man, in my, my opinion. Like the way he dressed, how he kept himself groomed. He was always neatly dressed. Like, I would go to the park as a kid and just chew on my shirt. Nobody ever told me not to, but when I saw him, it made me say, well, this is probably, how, this is the person that's going to inspire me, so I want to look like that. Anybody else? Um, do you know anyone else who, like, um, had your same situation but went down a different path? Yes, yes, um, it's a friend of mine, all right? So once I moved with my uh, my grandmother, I met some other kids in a different part of the neighborhood, all right? So I grew up on 26th S Avenue, but before I went on 34th, like somewhere in the year. And when I moved, there was this kid, his dad wasn't around, but he did have his mom, but his mom was on drugs. So the thing that my grand, my grandfather did for me, which was I had to be at be in the house before street lights would come on, right? Because you know these happen later on in the evening. But this particular kid didn't have that same uh, strict restriction, so he kind of would do whatever he wanted to do. And he ended up um, like during the day they would go steal cars and go. And I remember they asking me, I'm like, no, like my granddad has a big belt that would. You know, so that was, I wasn't scared of the police or anything, but that belt kept me from getting those cars, you know, so same, same situation for him. He, he decided to go, he ended up getting like 20 years in prison, you know, decisions, choices we made. To piggyback off her earlier question about would you change anything, like when you talk about, because everybody is going through something, right. regardless of whatever it is, whatever age, can you just talk about how to handle adversity? One of the ways that I would suggest that handling adversity is 
when you're going through something, try to take a step back, take a moment to breathe, right? Because when you give into your emotions, you get mad, and you give into that, you normally act the way or say things that you really don't mean, that really, that you really don't mean. But because you're angry, you just want to hurt that other person, right? So the way that I am now, when people attempt to try to hurt me or do things intentionally, I just take a step back and breathe and say, does this really matter? Is this really important enough for me to get, in, get into it with this person? Or if I'm going through an issue, I could be going through anything. I'm like, take a step back, breathe, and I want you to think through. But if I'm acting out of my emotions, acting in my feelings, it's going to be, I'm going to create more issues. I'm going to create more problems. But if I take a step back and say, breathe, okay, let's figure out what's going on. And I'm thinking clearly, I'm thinking calm, in a calm manner, I actually get better ideas than when I'm trying to think actually in the moment. Actually, I love reading. Um, right now, I'm on a, I read, I wake up at 5 a.m. and I'm reading The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Um, but my favorite author is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, but one of my other favorite books is called The Four Agreements. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but I would suggest reading The Four Agreements. The Four Agreements, it's called The Four Agreements. And one other book I would suggest is called It Didn't Start With You. It's basically a book about how everything you're going through, basically someone in your past may have went through it, and you could really be living out what happened with them versus it didn't just begin with you. So I definitely would suggest that book also. that I've played since I was basically five years old. I've been on some blue shoes. Definitely been on some blue shoes. But the way to get out the way to get out out of a loser streak is you gotta have a you're a leader of the team. If you're the leader of the team, the team is gonna follow your lead. So if you walk into the gym or you walk into an arena and your body language is reflecting like this, that doesn't inspire confidence. Right? But if, if we're losing in the middle of the game, we could be down 30, we could be down 10, two minutes. If I come in here and I say, hey, listen, we got this. We got this. Two minutes on the court, two minutes on the clock, we got this. Get a stop here, do this, we got this. It inspires a different energy. But if your lead on the team is uh, the referee who's called everything, placing blame, then that subconsciously sits on your team. That's why it's difficult to be a leader. Everybody can't be a leader. Sometimes we look at the best player, and I'm gonna say like a guy like um, Kevin Durant. He's talented, probably top two talented in the world, but he's not a leader. And the team is gonna follow his lead, and they just lost a big game. Thank you guys.